Well, good morning again. My name is Pastor Kurt, and I'm glad to be with you this morning. This week was my 20th wedding anniversary. Really wonderful. I'm glad to be married to Karen, and uh, I'm glad to be down here in Simi Valley. And so we've we've been here a little over six months, and I, I'm just I'm, I'm glad this is my life. And I, that was one of the things talking about with Karen as we had a nice dinner overlooking West Lake Lake, which is a terrible name for a lake, uh, but it was a great place to have dinner. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, open our eyes to your scriptures today, we pray, that it may move our hearts and our minds to love you and serve you with passion today. We pray that we will understand it well and that we will do it well as well. So help us, Lord, guide us this morning as we open your word. In Christ's name, amen. Well, uh, I took my kids to Zuma Beach recently and had a great time. They, you know, they're busy the whole time digging and exploring, splashing, doing the hijinks. And um, for as great a time as it was being there at the beach, I think if I were to offer my kids before we went the option of going to the beach or uh, playing on their tablets, I'm fairly certain that they would choose the tablets just about every day of the week. And <laughs> But I I can't really fault my kids, though, can I? Because, you know, I'm kind of into that sort of stuff, too. Uh, I I find myself falling into the hole of dumb internet videos a few too many times. So I, I know that my kids love their tablets, and some of that is totally fine. Um, but I started to think, why why do I want them to go to the beach? And I, I want them to go to the beach because I know that it's, it's real life, that it puts flesh on their life, it flesh on their experiences in a way that their tablets don't. And the funny part is that at this point in, in time, I actually get to choose which experience they get. Um, I'm not always going to have that, uh, that possibility. Like for me. Uh, it's not always, I'm the one who has to choose my own experiences. And I wonder if someone were to make choices for me, what would they choose for me? I think if someone were to choose experiences for me, they would give me opportunities for relationships, for connections with people. And uh, I think that they would, they would get, get me to plow into areas of my life that give me, give me roots in, in who I am and in who God is, things that really matter. Um, help me to have conviction in, in responses to the big questions of life, like, who am I? Uh, what do I really care about? And what am I here for? Uh, I, I think if somebody could choose, they would choose for me to explore God and, God and what God's existence means for my life. Uh, right now, we are in a season when many of us have felt like we are being bro- kind of peeled back to our most basic existence, all the core of who we are, and all the extraneous things from our life have been trimmed out. And at church, that's no different, really. There there aren't extra meals, there aren't outings or retreats. And right now at Simi Covenant Church, and I think at most others too, uh, we've been brought to a point where we are more than ever really back to our core things. It's about worship, it's about the word, Uh, And it's about some basic relationships, even if they're happening on the phone or on Zoom. In in this next season in in church, we are going to be plunging ourselves into Scripture, like what Pastor Matt said. We're going to be focusing on the New Testament and trying to approach it in a fresh way. And this is called Immerse. We have this resource resource in a a beautifully formatted New Testament here. And um, if you haven't gotten one yet, uh, like Matt said, please come and get one or order one online. Um, starting today as a church, we're going to read a few pages a day in Immerse and um, to really plunge ourselves into the text. And I want you to encourage you as well. If, I want you to think of somebody that you know, perhaps a friend who doesn't know Jesus, to say, hey, would you simply read the story about the life of Jesus and uh, what the first people who followed him did afterwards? Um, and we can let that speak for itself and let them be a part of our uh, discussion groups. Uh, I've, I've had a head start on some of us in, in this book and as I've prepared a bit for my sermons as we go forward. Uh, and I, I've really found it to be refreshing and new, vibrant and interesting in a new way. And I, I, I think that you're really going to like it. 
Looking at the rest of the summer and the fall, uh, something that I think that someone would choose for us would be something that is meaningful and lasting. And I think it would be this, to explore the New Testament. So this week you're going to throw yourself into the biography of Jesus and, and looking at the book of Luke. And um, just a couple words. This is how Immerse is set up. Um, it's set up so that they've broken up the different gospels so you don't read all four of the biographies of Jesus um, straight through. But they've put Luke with Acts. Luke wrote Acts as well. And also Luke traveled with Paul, so they put the writings of Paul afterwards. Uh, we put the book of Matthew, which was intended for a more Jewish audience, with some other books that were intended for Jewish audiences, like the book of Hebrews, and the book of James. Uh, the John things are put together, John and the three letters of John and the book of Revelation. Or the book of Mark, who got his text from, uh, from Peter, is put together with Peter and Jude. So that's how it's laid out. That's why it's put the way it is. I think it's um, going to be really um, a terrific experience for us, I hope. So I hope that, my hope for this is that in getting into the scriptures like this, that it will be fresh and it will give life to you. Uh, that you, you're going to have a, a sharpened awareness of God and that, uh, that you will see him in new ways in your daily life. That the, that the message of the scripture will speak to the deep questions that you have. One of the key New Testament passages that talks about scriptures is in 2 Timothy 3. So if you have a Bible, you can open that with me to 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. It says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I, I like gardening. I, I don't know if I'm particularly good at it. Uh, my, my plants do okay. I'm, it's not thriving, I guess. But uh, I find it satisfying to be able to plant seeds and uh, to be able to watch them grow and get to eat what comes up. I even, I even actually kind of like the weeding part. Uh, I had a pretty large garden in France, and, I, and one day I was out there weeding, and uh, I wondered to myself, gosh, what's more important, uh, weeding or sowing seeds? And it's kind of a dumb question because actually you, you need to do both. And uh, I think that that's what I was getting at. I realized that I had, I had put seeds in lots of different places, but it was really important for me to go through and weed as well. So, you know, if you, if you only weed, but you never sow, there's not going to be anything in your garden. Um, if you only sow and never weed, then the weeds are just going to choke out your plants. In, in our lives as Christians, we also have to do some um, sowing, some seeding, and some weeding. We need to sow and we need to weed. And so we learn about broken down ways in our thinking and we, we adjust our thinking to God's ways. That's a way of weeding. Uh, we, we turn away from broken down habits. That's weeding. We say no. That's weeding. Uh, but it when we do that kind of weeding, it also makes space for good things to grow. So we learn about the amazing gift of God's grace, and that sows something in our soul. Uh, we consider Christ's actions for, for us, and that's sowing. We, we welcome new life-giving habits, and that, that sows in us. So we, we need to both weed and to sow. And, and reading and applying the scriptures pushes us to do both of those things if we're doing it right. A true preaching of the good news is going to, to call us out of broken down patterns and then into life. Right now we're going to look at a few big themes and questions that come up in life. Things that uh, our Christian faith answers differently than the surrounding world of advertisers and others would tell us. And in each of these three areas, there's going to be, need to be some things that are going to be planted and some things that need to be weeded out. So why, why read the Bible? I think that's our big question for today. Why do we read the Bible? And 
Today, in this passage in 2 Timothy, a couple of things stood out to me. I realized that as we dive into the scriptures, we see that they answer the big questions that I mentioned earlier. They answer the question of who am I? What do I really care about? And what am I here for? So the first question is, who am I? We, we read the Bible because it shapes a right identity in us. So it says in the passage that we just read, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and what you've become convinced of, because you know that those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Second Timothy was probably the last letter that Paul wrote, and he wrote it to his apprentice, Timothy, who he hoped would be kind of taking over his ministry. And as Paul develops his thought, the, he ties the validity of the scriptures to the that people that Timothy has learned these things from. And in one sense, this establishes the truthfulness of the scriptures uh, because uh, Paul was an apostle and Timothy presumably could have met many eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Uh, but there are plenty of reasons even for us today to believe and be convinc uh, convinced of the authenticity of the biblical writings. Uh, the New Testament has, is a better preserved document than anything else from antiquity. There are more uh, numerous documents and fragments and manuscripts than any other ancient, manu ancient writings out there, much more. And because they're so numerous, you can even cross-check those for authenticity. And you know what? They are very consistent. Now, in decades past, the, there were probably more questions about, is the Bible authentic? And that would maybe trouble more people's faith. And that may not be your big question. It's interesting to me that Paul presses in on another area that, that speaks maybe a bit more to our contemporary world. He says, in effect, Timothy, continue in these things because they, you've seen how they worked themselves out in the lives of the people that you love, and also you've seen it in your own experience. So the, this answers this nagging question of who are you? Uh, who am I? We are, first of all, connected to other people. Uh, uh, Without this outside experience from other people, we're not going to really be able to see ourselves for who we are. And uh, it's, it's helpful for us to, to connect with other Christians from around the world who can speak into our lives like we've been able to, and we were able to see how faith works out in their lives. Uh, Leslie Newbegin was a missionary from Great Britain, and he spent 40 years working in India um, in the 20th century. And when Newbegin returned back home to Great Britain, he experienced a greater shock than what he had experienced in India. Uh, the churches from his own country, they, he felt uh, these are the people who had sent him on the mission field in the first place. They had, they had kind of given in to a different story about the world, and one that they hadn't even noticed that they had slipped into. And, and what Newbegin writes about is that he saw that the church had given in to this myth of progress that the culture around him was speaking of. The myth of progress is that the world is moving on toward an evolutionary trajectory of, being, of greater heights of human knowledge and of moral behavior. People expected Christians then to, to just leave behind their silly superstitions, like things like miracles, or their old-fashioned rules sticking with traditional morality. So we, but he was able... Uh, this guy, Leslie Newbegin, was able to see these things because he had been in another context and he had experienced the life of other Christians. He was able to say, these are real Christians. I've seen how they live their faith. And as I follow their lives, they're able to then, I'm able to say that is valid. And it helps me then to see my own faith with a bit more perspective and challenge it. You know, the world has seen progress in science and in human rights, but there hasn't been progress in human goodness. And we, I think we see that all around us. So scripture says that we need to be connected to other people. And I think it's great in our world of con our connected world today, we can be connected with people from other cultures who can help us to see things that are our blind spots. And they can help us to see the world a bit differently and identify places that, that we are um, not following the Lord. Um, 
So we are, part, we are connected with other people, and that's important to our faith. And that's who I am. I am somebody who is connected with God's worldwide fellowship. Um, I'm also somebody who has experienced God's work in my own life. Um, he says, Timothy, listen, you, you experienced this. Uh, he, he says, you know the scriptures. You know how that has moved you toward this life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and if you are a follower of Jesus, I think that I can say to you the same thing. You, you have experienced moments in your life where you have uh, met the Lord in Scripture and seen that play out in good ways in your life. Or um, maybe you've known the wisdom of Scripture and done something else. You have, there are areas where you have followed your own way and um, known maybe what God says and you've seen maybe how that blew up and it went wrong. Uh, but I hope that you've been able to also see the grace and mercy of returning to God, this, this God who offers us welcome again and again to come back to him. If you're still investigating and exploring what life and faith means, or maybe you feel like you just don't know really the scriptures that well, um, this is a great time for you to explore this a bit more. You can read or even listen for yourself. The, the Immerse study even has um, audio version online you can listen to. Um, and you can listen to this and see where you are led to go. But you are also, who you are is you are a person who is loved by an amazing God. Undergirding all of the scriptures, the, the scriptures that Paul says that Timothy knows so well, is, uh, is that God, the scriptures connect us to Christ Jesus. The, the whole of the Bible story is about this amazing, loving God who has stuck with his people even when they turn from him. In fact, rather than, than waiting for us to come to God, he came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. These holy scriptures aren't just a book of rules. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are ways of living in step with God's spirit, but the arc of the biblical narrative is that the Old Testament, the Old Testament points forward to Jesus and to what he was going to do. And the New Testament points back, then saying that this one did come. God did that thing that we said. It all centers on who Jesus is. And, and that relates to you. Because who are you? You are somebody who matters to God. You, are, you matter to God, and that's why he acted. And, and it begins with some bad news. That you and I have have turned our backs on God over and over again. We've left him, we've, we've gone against him, we've ignored him. But the good news is that God is calling us into life. And he, he's sowing this truth about ourselves. It's kind of a mixture of good news and bad news. That, that you are a person who needed Christ to die for him or for her. But God also counted it worthwhile to do that for you. That he wanted you. You are cared for by an amazing God. So the scriptures answer this question of who am I by giving us a right identity, an identity that's connected to other people around us, for it's connected to our experience with the world, and it's, it's connected to God, and that's who we are. Now, my second couple of questions are a bit briefer. The second question was, what do I really care about? When we read the Bible, it shapes us to have right passions, is what I'm calling it. Things, passions, like something that you can really get excited about. So if we are framed by Scripture, our identity is going to be sorted out by God. And then we are going, if that is the case, then we're going to care for things differently. We're going to care less about some things than we did before. And we're going to care more about some things that we didn't care about before. Ancient Christian writer Augustine said that virtue is about rightly ordering our loves. And that means to give every person or object the right degree of love that it deserves. It's terrific. And that's in line, um, Aristotle, not a Christian, um, he was before Christ, but Aristotle says something that, that I think aims in the right direction. He says that the aim of education is to make the pupil like and dislike what he or she ought. Uh, so we're, we're, what are the right things for us to like or dislike? 
And that's what Paul is getting at when he says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, or training in righteousness. That we've got these scriptures that are to help us to, to teach and, and correct us and, and move us in the right direction. What are the things we're supposed to love? What are the things that we're supposed to dislike? So as followers of Jesus, we, we come to scripture asking God, not, not telling God what he's supposed to say, but asking God, what are the things that we're supposed to rightly love or what order of love we should put them in? What things are supposed to be weeded out of us? What things need to be sown? So we care less about some things than we did before. We, we care, we're supposed to care less about material things, about, about always being number one, about getting credit for things, about getting everything that we feel like we deserve. We're supposed to care less about that. And because our identity is rooted in God, we have some of the strength to be able to do that. But we also care more about things that we may not have cared about or paid attention to before. Uh, we, we care about our neighbors. Uh, we, we, we are supposed to love our enemies. But we care about other people who don't bring anything to us. We, we give without expecting something in return. And we care about other people and marginalized people and I, I just want to say a little aside here. Um, in order for all lives to matter, um, some people have had to stand up and scream, Black Lives Matter. And because it is true that all lives matter. Um, but from the look of things in our world today, it doesn't seem always like all lives do matter. And I, so I hope you don't get hung up on this. I'm sure it might have been clearer for them to maybe say, Black Lives Matter too. Um, but they didn't mean that to mean, only black lives matter. And, and I know that all this has gotten mixed up in a bunch of political stuff that has muddied the waters and made it ugly when it shouldn't have been. But I want to tell you what I have heard from black brothers and sisters, that this is something that matters. That because in the past it seems like they haven't mattered, that it's a chance for them to say we do actually matter. And that, that's something, I got to tell you, I remember when I first started learning about this and it's still sometimes uh, there are questions in this that make me uncomfortable and I don't know how to do it. I, I think I remember, um, I remember first having a conversation about this with some people and I felt personally attacked. I thought, gosh, you know, what are you, what are you saying about me? And, um, but the thing that got me to, to persist, to, to stick with this question, was a conviction that this is something that was connected to Scripture to something God wanted my heart to grow in, that it wasn't just a fad, it wasn't just something that was in my culture, but it was something that was about a person that God cared about. So scripture was pushing me to love my neighbor as myself. And that meant I needed to care about something that I might not give attention to otherwise. And in our church, we've seen people do that in other ways too, right? I mean, gosh, uh, we had people walk six kilometers for clean water in Congo for people we we're probably never going to see. Um, but we did that. So God, that's not natural to us, but we do it because we love you. And uh, we, we pray that the Lord will move our hearts to care for people who are made in God's image. And uh, for different people in our church to get excited about new things, for you to have initiatives that, move, that you can move in ministry. I hope that you are freed up to move in ministry as God puts new things that he, on your heart for things for you to care about. Now, when you hear this, you might feel like things are getting a little too touchy-feely for you, right? You feel like, hey, this is a bit much for me. And you know what? The author C.S. Lewis, he spoke to this. He had something to say. He, he admits that, yeah, you know, there are some people out there who are too touchy-feely. It's true. But he says, there are many more people who need to have their senses and sensibilities refreshed. So here's a quote from um, his book, The Abolition of Man. For every pupil who needs to be guarded from a weak excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. Like just, just wake up, get out of this. The right defense against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. 
So what he's saying basically is that if we are afraid of getting blown around by what's happening in the world, and if it's, we don't want to just be too fruity and touchy-feely, what we need to do, the best way to protect ourselves against that is to care passionately, crazily for something that really matters and to set our hearts on that thing. Uh, we, need to, we need to care for something that is true and just. So the scriptures shape our passions so we need to care for things that ultimately matter. Love God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and what? And love your neighbor as yourself. So let's let God shape our passion for those things. So what have we heard so far? Scripture shapes our identity and scripture is supposed to shape our passions. And finally, the scripture is supposed to shape our right goals. The third question is, what am I here for? What am I doing here? And 2 Timothy 3.17 says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You are here for doing good work. You have been made with certain gifts and abilities, experiences, and you know what? Maybe you have had more than your fair share of hardships thrown at you. But God can redeem those things. And he's using that, you, the special person that God has made you to be, to, to serve in his world and to make, make something new. In, in the chapter before this one, in 2 Timothy, Paul writes that God's people will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. What is your purpose? To be used by the master and to do any good work. Uh, it also says in, uh, in Ephesians, we have been created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way we live our lives. Ephesians 2.10. This is the Spirit of God working in us through the Word of God. So what are you here for? You are here to serve the Lord, to glorify God in your words and in your life and the things that you do. So back to this guy, Leslie Newbegin, the missionary who returned to Great Britain. He says, the choice for the church in every age will always be, will our identity be shaped by scripture or by our culture, by the biblical story or by the cultural story? It's wonderful. The cultural story around us says that you are worth what you can produce. And that's not what I'm saying right now. You're not just an audience to be targeted. You're not a consumer just to be reached. You're not a commodity to be used. That's not what you're here for. You do have purpose and worth, and it flows out of who your identity is in God. And it flows out then of what he is, he is doing in this relationships with you and other people and your passions moving toward what God has for you. The biblical story is that the longing that we feel for identity and significance and purpose aren't just products of our chemistry. And I, and I think you know that intuitively. These things are hardwired into us. So today can be a moment when we allow ourselves not to be distracted but to focus on the things that matter most. To, to focus on the, the things that can really address the questions that we have. And I think it's in scripture for us. I'll close with this. Uh, William Tyndale, who, was, who lived at the end of the 15th century into the early 16th century, um, he was, uh, people hated his efforts to try to translate the Bible into the language of the people. And on one occasion, he, was, he got into a fight with a, with a learned man. And the, uh, he replied to this learned man, he said, If God spares my life before many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow that he will know more scripture than you do. Because William Tyndale was confident that scripture is something that we can access, that we will be excited about, that it answers our big questions. And it's something that has power and we can, we, can, we can access. So what should we do? Will you join with me in knowing a bit more about scripture? 
about jumping in to these big questions of life and, and have it shape our identity and our passions and our goals. So join with me in, in reading through Immerse. Uh, we're going to read through the whole New Testament together in this season. So let's talk about it in small groups. Let's talk about it in our sermons on Sundays. And I'm hoping that you'll talk about it with your friends as well. I want you to get absorbed in this story because it really is about this wonderful thing between God and you. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the gift of your word. May it shape me this week to know who I am and root me in you. Uh, may, may it change my passion so that I will care about things I should and not care about things that I shouldn't. And, and may you use it to shape my goals as well, things that I consider important and where I where I aim my life. May that be the case for all of us this week. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.